The world loves spice. The exotic ingredients in so many of our favorite dishes have revolutionized the way we eat. But the search for these amazing tastes now found in every kitchen cupboard changed the course of history. This is a journey to find out how spices shaped our modern world. I'm going to be visiting some of their exotic birthplaces and traveling the globe to discover just how these spices made it to our tables. I'll be meeting the people whose lives depend on them and following the trail of the first spice explorers. Empires built and destroyed, immense fortunes made and countless lives lost during one of the most exciting periods of discovery in the history of the Western world and all in the name of spice. Like most people, I have a cupboard full of spices, dried seeds and bark that we all think of as commonplace. But back in the 15th century, two spices in particular led the Europeans to travel beyond the known world. I followed them to India looking for pepper before heading to Sri Lanka to find cinnamon. This is known as the Spice Coast, 300 miles of shoreline with lush tropical forests and a labyrinth of waterways. And more often than not, hot weather and blue skies. But this is monsoon season. Our story begins with a spice that every single one of us will have in our cupboards or on our tables. It's so ordinary and everyday that we utterly take it for granted, and it's this. Black pepper. But this was once so valuable, it was known as black gold, and in medieval times, if you stole a handful of peppercorns like this, it was as lucrative as doing a successful bank raid today. Serving black pepper to your guests was undeniable proof of your wealth and power. This was once the world's most sought after spice and it comes from here, Kerala in southern India. Our love affair with pepper dates back to the Romans. They couldn't get enough of the stuff. And it wasn't just roads and plumbing they brought to Europe. They left us with a taste for what they called Piper Negrum. But what do we really know about this spice? To find out, I'm travelling high into the hills of Iduki, one of Kerala's premier pepper growing areas. This is sacred and protected land, home to an ancient tribal people. The Manan have been cultivating pepper for centuries. It's a really effective use of land, actually, isn't it? Karen Bakshi, a former chef, understands this spice and now works with the tribe, growing and selling it. Now, I'm going to just have a closer look at what's going on here. I can't believe. These are the, are the ladders. Yeah, these are the bamboo poles they use to climb up. I mean, it... it a very you, traditional practice. It is very traditional, but it looks terrifying. The wine is not that strong. Right, so of course. It creates a very good balance. So you don't want yeah. a great heavy yes. thing up above it. I mean, you, you make it look very easy and very comfortable. <laughs> can, I, can I have a go? So, let's see. Right. And then I'm... Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> it's quite wobbly. So how... Oh my goodness, I'm not sure this is a good idea. So you... 
<laughs> it's twisting. So pepper is, is basically a creeper, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's a creeper and it's attached to a tree called the coral tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the berries, pepper berries. So you, you stand up and then you pluck. Okay. This is how it's plucked. So and you pluck the whole thing and you yes, put it put in, it your in your sarong like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to come down. Woo! I'm going to leave you to be the expert. Thank you very much. Please carry on. <laughs> so pepper is probably the most familiar spice to us. Yes. You know, it's good old black pepper. Yes. Is white pepper something quite different? It's a very common question which people ask because they think that white pepper comes from a different tree, yeah. a different creeper, but it's not. The white pepper, the black pepper and the green pepper come from the same uh, wine. What happens with black pepper, you're drying it in the sun. Uh -huh. and it's holding up all the flavors and it becomes roasted black color. But what happens with white pepper is you soak them in water to remove the outer skin, the ah, green skin. Okay. And that's what uh, makes it much more milder and it's white in color and of course not that pungent. Not, not that yeah. pungent. So yeah. that dried would become a black peppercorn. Yeah, absolutely, yes. That soaked would become a white peppercorn. White pepper. Huh. But it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Pepper has been harvested like this in India for thousands of years, and for centuries, the people who sold it to the rest of the world were Arab traders. They knew where to find it, and they weren't about to let anyone else in on the secret. Back in the 15th century, Europeans had no idea how pepper was produced. And to be honest, neither do I. So do you just whoosh, like that? No. No? No way. You trample it? Yeah. Can I try? Yeah. Okay, so... so. <laughs> like this? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a little pepper dance. <laughs> what do you think, girls? Good? What's extraordinary when you're doing this, as badly as I clearly am, is that you get the smell of pepper coming up from your feet. Go on, you, you do it. This is how it should be done. So next time you're grinding peppercorns onto your scrambled eggs of the morning, you can remember how those peppercorns started life. So look at that. One little dance and whole fistfuls of pepper. So, pick the berries, dance on them, and leave them out in the sun for three days, and hey presto, you've got the black peppercorns we know and love. It really is as simple as that. But for centuries in the West, pepper was a luxury item and came with an air of mystique. The European map of the world still had plenty of blank spaces, and Pepper's unknown origins gave rise to all sorts of fantastic stories. One such tale was that Pepper forests were guarded by highly venomous flying serpents. Once the berries were ripe, people would come along and set fire to the forests, driving away the snakes and engulfing the plants in flames. Those flames would turn the berries black and give them their fiery taste. The berries then had to be harvested at breakneck speed before furious serpents returned to wreak their revenge. These tall tales suited the Arab traders who were making a fortune while protecting their source. The spice was sent on a marathon journey, travelling from here to the tables of the rich in the West. 
and along the way were plenty of merchants charging a hefty markup. Today in Kerala, there are still plenty of spice traders doing very nicely out of pepper. How much for 100 grams of black pepper? 50 rupees, 5 euro. 50, 50 rupees. rupees. Shouldn't, should I bargain? Hmm? Should, I, should I be saying... No, bargain, no, no, no. Bargain, 40. Price. 40. <laughs> no, bargain, no, fit price. No, I say 40. 40. <laughs> OK, you're going to win this one. Thank you very much. Singing is fascinating. <laughs> Do you think he only sings when he's making money? <laughs> so it has been a pleasure doing dance. Well, you have to sing. Okay, wait, wait. <laughs> Pepper may have been expensive, but there was no shortage of people willing to pay the price. In the 15th century, these little dried berries not only spiced up the food of the rich, they were also believed to be a cure for the plague, the Black Death ravaging Europe. The Arabs had total control of the pepper trade and the vast income it produced. But that was all about to change. On the 8th of July, 1497, Portugal sent their finest navigator, Vasco da Gama, in search of pepper. Da Gama was 37 years old and the son of a nobleman with a reputation for steely determination. He was going to need it. Da Gama's flotilla headed for the coast of Africa. Using the monsoon winds to propel them around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean. Finally, in May of 1498, da Gama's crew landed on the Malabar coast, making them the first Europeans to find the sea route to India. It's reported that da Gama's little fleet landed here, and legend has it that da Gama and his men marched up the beach shouting, for Christ and spices! Although more likely, some poor soul was sent ahead and only when he came back in one piece did da Gama go ashore. Although obviously that version isn't quite so good for posterity. But whatever the truth, there is no denying the fact that the Portuguese had hit the jackpot. They had landed here in Kerala, the birthplace of Peppa. When da Gama first arrived on India's Malabar coast, he expected to find a few godless savages who would happily trade their black gold for a few worthless European fripperies. But what he was actually met by was a cosmopolitan melting pot of enormous wealth and sophistication. This is Cochin, Spice City Central. And for centuries, traders came here from far and wide in search of pepper. Muslims, Jews, Arabs and Chinese. In the 1400s, this was a boom town. Pepper was to Cochin what oil is to the Gulf states today. In trading halls throughout Cochin, spice deals are going on every day. The spice on sale today is ginger. What's fascinating is how these deals are being conducted in silence and in secret. So what you're doing is you are trying to agree a price ah. and you do it in secret? In secret. Under here? Ah. Yeah. Can you show me the hand signals? He's uh, asking 200. 200 is two fingers. Oh. Yeah. Then you are. Uh, and then I say two. Six. Six. Five, is or that, five, that. five plus one. Five plus one, so that. Six. Uh, six That's six. incredibly complicated. Uh. Seven is this. Eight is that two, one. Two times. Ah, two, oh, two times. Two times. Four and four. 
These hand signals evolved over centuries from the need to have a common language among traders from all over the world. Six. Six? Ah. Five. five. How do you seven. know that's not ten, though? It's the same seven. as ten. <laughs> uh, this one, I think this that one, would be a very bad This one, trade. eight. That's eight. Ah, uh, 208. 208. In theory, all this secrecy means a better deal for the seller. It's like a game of poker. And the buyers are trying to call the seller's bluff. But I'm not fooling anyone. So now we have agreed the deal. Do you shake hands under here? What, how do you, when you no, say, no. I agree? I agree. Uh, up. That goes up. Yeah. And the deal is finished. Deal it. Uh -huh. I, I, I will say, you take it. In the Middle Ages, pepper was so valuable that to prevent theft, workers handling the spice were forbidden from wearing trousers with cuffs or pockets. And when coins were scarce, pepper was used as currency, hence the term peppercorn rent. Today, pepper is the only spice that's quoted on the stock market. Everything's done in secret under this towel. And these guys have just walked in. They made an offer to the seller who just... So clearly, uh, there are some big deals going on. But it's just an amazing way of selling stuff. And this scene could be a thousand years ago apart from the shiny sandals and the mobile phones, of course. Dagama may have found an established business community in Cochin, but the sea route opened up by the Portuguese introduced new European traders to the Indian pepper market. And today, as then, it's all about supply and demand. Do you sell pepper? Yes, short, short. Pepper short? Why? That's so less crop. So crop is down? Uh -huh. Really? But less crop. Here also less crops. Good this demand. is the home of pepper. Demand is, less. Demand is good. Demand is, demand is high. But... International crop is less. Ah. Indonesia. But why is there a shortage of the spice here in India? To find out, I need to head north to the traditional heartland of pepper production in Kerala, Wynad a place the traders of Dagama's time knew as the Pepper Mountains. This 400-acre pepper plantation has been run by Victor Day for the last 17 years. There should be a fabulous spread here of vines and berries but that's far from the case. This is unexpected. I was expecting to see lushness and plants <laughs> everywhere, and this looks like a scene of devastation. It is, it is. Every single tree that you see here yeah. had pepper growing up it, as you can see. So that, it, that was a pepper vine? A pepper vine, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all wilt. Wilt? Yeah. It's a fungal Wilt. attack which has hit the pepper. Not only mine, but uh, the entire district. But I thought the Wynard was the, the absolute epitome of pepper production in the whole of Kerala. Exactly. And that's, why, that's what made Wynard uh, famous. And pepper was a natural crop here. It, it just took off. You, you, you planted the slips, and the next thing you know, three years later, you've got a, a luxuriant uh, a pepper vine. And how much pepper did you produce on the whole estate? 25 tons. 25, 25 tons? 25 tons, yes. And now? And now, <laughs> with difficulty, uh, a ton, a little over a ton last year. That explains them, because I met these guys in Cochin who said, you know, people desperately want pepper. The pepper market yeah, is, is yeah. really strong. Local, apparently local demand is going up as well, but they simply can't get it, and I couldn't understand it. I thought, this is the home of pepper. It's all because of the wilt. So you've lost an enormous amount. Huge amount, huge amount. It is definitely spreading, without doubt.
Oh, this, this was a beautiful area at one time. Yeah. It's sad when you see it like this. Isn't it? The spice that drew the world to India's shores and grew in abundance all over this landscape is now under threat. At risk are the livelihoods of the tribe's people whose small pepper farms are scattered in the mountains. It's harvest time in Kerala. And festivals like this, deep in the heart of Wainad, are rooted in traditions that are thousands of years old. These isolated communities depend on pepper, and the disease that has ravaged the crop has touched the lives of everyone here and none more so than local farmer Janesh Joseph. Janesh and his brother Suresh were raised on this farm where their father grew pepper. When the plants were ravaged by the disease, tragedy struck. So the pepper crop failed. The pepper is destroyed due to the disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ev so you, everything on the farm? Everything on the farm. Destroyed. And destroyed. We could not get money from any other crops. Your entire family income disappeared. And disappeared. That is the main problem. Father was disappointed and he decided to die. He climbed a tree and he hung the tree. So he said, due to the loss of pepper. In the last five years, there have been as many as 200 suicides among pepper farmers. But the brothers refused to give up. They left their studies to help rescue the farm and repay the debts their father left behind. And by introducing soil nutrients and a new strain of plant, they're growing pepper on their farm once again. To celebrate the harvest, the twins have invited me to a family meal prepared by their mother, Eliama. Smells delicious. And naturally, pepper is very much on the menu. Pepper. Pepper. Aha, uh -huh. from here, from your farm. OK. Look at this. Pickles. Pickle, it's a pickle. Pepper pickles. Oh, so. These are pickle made out of the pepper berries. How amazing. Oh, this looks delicious. I think it might be potato. Yam. 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 It's yam. It's not potato. It's yam. OK. This one. So you're putting pepper in here. Wow, pepper and everything. The lovely thing that I'm beginning to discover about Indian cooking is that you never have to do anything on your own. You have a whole team. Well, this is our pepper feast. Peppered yams, peppered beef, peppered beetroot, pepper pickle, and pepper soup. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> you try saying pepper pickle at this time of day. And this is a pickle tea. Sorry. Girls, I'm Okay, small, small. Oh, perfect. Okay, delicious. What was so wonderful about this food is the taste of the pepper is incredibly strong. You absolutely know that you're eating a pepper-based dish. And the pepper tastes completely different from the pepper we have at home, maybe because it literally is grown on the doorstep. It's delicious, Eliana. Thank you. But in India, pepper isn't just used for seasoning food. It's used for something even more fundamental. For over 5,000 years, Indians have been turning to a traditional system of medicine to treat their ailments. It's called Ayurveda, and it means science of life. It originated here in Kerala, and pepper is one of its main ingredients. Dr. Mary Smitter is a renowned practitioner of this ancient medicine. 
My goodness, this is like a treasure trove. Uh, it's amazing. It's like a sort of wizard's workshop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everything you use in Ayurvedic medicine, all mm -hmm. these wonderful uh, barks and seeds, it's all natural. You use no chemicals at all. Yeah, it's completely natural. Uh, actually, plants have the energy from nature. Plants are deep-rooted in nature. So we are using that energy for our body. We are okay. trying to blend the energy of nature and trying to bring about an equilibrium in a human body. Ayurveda comes from Kerala. Mm -hmm. Pepper, as I now have discovered, That's also true. comes from Kerala. Mm -hmm. So what would you, in Ayurvedic medicine, use pepper for? Pepper is a decongestant. It's a very good decongestant. Mm -hmm. It can be used in all the respiratory ailments. I mean, mm -hmm. even asthma, would it help with that? Uh, definitely, this can help, you know. This can bring down cholesterol levels and it's a powerful okay. antibacterial and antiviral medicine. So this little berry has not just made a lot of people very, very rich over the years, it's made a lot of people very healthy. That's true. It is a little wonder berry. So I wonder, what could it do for me? I can detect a little bit of fatigue, probably... Uh, fatigue? Yeah. Is there anything in Ayurvedic medicine that can give me a bit of a kind of energy boost? Oh, well, there is this wonder drug, that is the long pepper. Long uh, pepper? Yeah. Where is it? Piper longum. Wow. Here. Look at that. Can I taste it? Yeah, of course you can taste. Is it going to blow my head off? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Back in medieval Europe, this close relative to black pepper was every bit as popular. Today, though, it's most commonly used as an Ayurvedic cure. It sort of explodes. On the, it's on, really on the tip of your tongue, the mm -hmm. taste, isn't mm -hmm. it? I put uh, six grams of powder in mm -hmm. one glass of milk. My tongue is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Pepper flavours the cuisine, the economy, the medicine and the traditions of this part of India, an offering worthy of the gods themselves. On the banks of the Pampa River in central Kerala, pepper is being offered to honour the local Hindu deity. These men, many of them local farmers, are about to take to the water in the most important contest of a harvest festival that lasts 10 whole days. It's known as Onam. This team from Malapuracherry are hot favourites to win. And since I'm hitching a lift up river with their supporters, I've decided to adopt them as my team. This is the start of the most traditional boat race in all of India. It's kind of intrinsic to the Onam festival, one of the most important parts. The spectacular snake boat race is a 2,000-year-old event featuring the largest teams of any sport in the world. And these incredible-looking boats have got a hundred oarsmen apiece, and each boat represents a local village. Forty villages, many located in Pepper Country, are taking part. What a spectacle! The Malapura Cherry team have been victorious for the last two years, and I'm hoping they'll make it a hat trick. Good luck, guys! Come on, guys! Oh, it's going to be neck and neck, this one. Three boats together, and there's hardly a whisker in it. Go on! Oh, they're paddling their hearts out. Come on! Go, guys! woo -hoo! It was a close-run thing, but my boys didn't get their hat trick. They couldn't have tried harder. And they look absolutely exhausted. 
I think it might be time for a traditional pick-me-up, Ayurvedic style. Namaskar. Can I have some chai? Chai. Tea? For me? Please? I have this spice. You know this? Trippari. Trippari. Kippari. Trippari. Trippari. In, in English, long pepper. Uh. And um, an Ayurvedic doctor uh. told me it's very good for lots of energy. It makes uh. you bounce. <laughs> Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic. Ayurvedic. So can I, can I use this and, uh. and pound it grind, up? Grind, grind. Grind, exactly. Uh. Is that okay? Uh. Okay. <laughs> it's quite hard, isn't it? Let me try. There's a woman who knows how to grind. It will make you very strong. Yes, yes. Good? Do you, yes, do you yes, feel very... Yes. <laughs> okay, that's enough. A little bit of pepper in. Okay, what do you think? Good? It's weird. You can't really taste the pepper. The Suda likes it. Okay. So, despite winning all their heats decisively, and it was an incredibly exciting competition, sadly, my adopted team didn't win. They came second. So, there are fairly dejected a lot of boys today. So, I know what's going to pep them up and give them strength to win next year's race. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry you didn't win, but you were magnificent. We thought you were great. So try this. It'll give you energy after all your work. The climax of the 10-day Onam festival is a procession of all the boats to the main temple. And it certainly looks as if my team may have benefited from the pepper pick-me-up. <laughs> Women are not allowed in the boats, so I'm making my way by foot to meet up with the team at the temple, where everyone is giving thanks for the harvest to the all-bestowing god, Patasati. And despite their earlier disappointment, my team's spirits seem high. By the turn of the 16th century, the Portuguese were at the forefront of the spice race. And with Western appetites for exotic tastes running high, what they couldn't obtain through trade, they took by force. In the name of pepper, the Portuguese laid siege to the spice coast of India. Eight years after da Gama first landed in Kerala, the Portuguese had established a fairly firm foothold here. They built this fort and in it put their first viceroy in India. Then, pretty confident that they had control over the pepper trade, their quest for spices turned south.
they set forth in search of another rare taste highly desired amongst the rich in 16th century Europe. A spice for which they were prepared to pay exorbitant prices. Cinnamon. Even rarer and more expensive than pepper, its source was a mystery. The Portuguese were constantly raiding Arab ships along the Indian coast and often found cinnamon among the cargo. They suspected the source for the spice was nearby, but the ocean beyond Kerala was, as far as the Portuguese were concerned, uncharted waters. But in 1506, Portuguese sailors pursuing an Arab merchant ship found themselves adrift in rough seas in the Indian Ocean and sought shelter on an unfamiliar coast. The Portuguese landed here on the shores of Sri Lanka, or Ceylon as it was then known, little realising that the bad weather had brought them to exactly the place they were looking for. Now, as was customary in those days, I'll give you a hand. They asked the locals to take them to their king. Now, the Portuguese are pitched up in the kingdom of Cote, not a very big kingdom. And the locals wanted to impress these exotic foreigners. So instead of taking them the direct route to the king, which only would have taken a couple of hours and given the impression that the kingdom was tiny, they took them on a circuitous route that took about three days. And the phrase, taking the Portuguese to Cote, has now entered local parlance. And it's kind of the Sri Lankan equivalent of being led on a wild goose chase. Back then, Cote was one of several kingdoms that made up the exotic island of Ceylon. The rival rulers were constantly at each other's throats, a situation that the Portuguese were able to exploit in their attempts to control the cinnamon trade. This is the coastal town of Gaul, and I haven't had to look far to find the spice that was once so coveted. Cinnamon. From Sri Lanka? Yes, yeah, from Sri Lanka. Number one quality cinnamon in Sri Lanka. Number one quality. Yeah. Good morning. But to see where cinnamon actually grows, I need to head into the dense jungles of nearby Hikadua. This is cinnamon country, and I'm here to meet local farmer Primal Wick Ravnasinga. Are you Primal? How are you? Very well. What a beautiful, beautiful place. You are welcome. <gasps> it's amazing. It's like a sort of mythical jungle. Come. Okay. This farm has been in Primal's family for more than three generations. He took it over 20 years ago and transformed it into an organic farm producing high quality cinnamon. I will okay. show you cinnamon. Well, that would be wonderful because I have no idea um, how. The cinnamon that we see in those funny little sticks in a yeah. jar yeah. gets from a real living plant. I can't even imagine what the plant looks like. Yeah. This is cinnamon. This is These cinnamon are the cinnamon here. plants. This is uh, organic cinnamon. They are, now they are harvesting. I'm going to try and get close yeah. without getting yeah. my yeah. arm chopped off. But does it? It doesn't smell now. Do the leaves smell of cinnamon? You can, you can smell this. Just you oh, can, yeah. just you can bite, bite ten. You can taste this. Oh yeah, it's an yeah. incredible yeah. taste. And this is called uh, cinnamon silanica. Of course, yeah. Sri Lankan cinnamon. Yeah. It's the bark of these branches that cinnamon is made from. I'm looking at these guys doing all this work. Can I have a go? Yeah. Like this, towards the bush. Okay. The trick to harvesting is to cut with strength and accuracy. So all I have to do is make two well-aimed incisions. Oh, I'm making a right it's mess. It's really hard. Really hard. Well, that's the theory. Oh, 
I think a career in forestry doesn't await. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot for me, I'm trying. Like, yeah. Okay. It's easier if we roll it like this, no? Okay. And then cut down. Yeah, that's right. 20 years practice, I reckon I could be quite good at this. Yeah. It's hard to believe that from this ordinary-looking branch comes a spice adored since ancient times. Back then, they may have loved it, but like me, they had no idea of the origins of cinnamon. 5th century BC historian Herodotus came up with his own colourful version of the cinnamon story. Do you know the Herodotus story? No. You don't? No. He said that cinnamon was gathered from the nests of birds, and there were these giant birds who would make nests out of cinnamon sticks. Uh -huh. But their nests were right up on inaccessible cliffs, yeah. so you couldn't get to them. So the way that the cinnamon had to be gathered was that the people of the villages where these nests were built would kill an animal and leave huge chunks of meat underneath the nest. Yeah. The birds would come down, gather up the meat, take it up to their nests. The meat was so heavy, hey, yeah. the nests would collapse. There were your cinnamon sticks. What a palaver! Yeah, yeah, Mind you, it yeah. might have been easier than yeah. me putting yeah. <laughs> The myth may be far-fetched, but it seems that what I'm witnessing here can't have changed too much since the time of Herodotus. <laughs> The skills of the cinnamon peelers have been passed down from generation to generation and go back thousands of years. The first part of the process is to strip the outer bark of the branch to reveal the golden inner bark, which is the cinnamon. It's like peeling a big carrot or something. Yes, right, yes. And you have to remove every little bit, but really finely, so you yes, don't right. dig into no, the stuff no, underneath. No. This rubbing process that yes. he's doing now, yes. that's loosening Definitely. this you bark. Yes. Next comes the most intricate operation, making a series of incisions to separate the cinnamon from the branch. The workers here are paid by how much cinnamon they cut. So it pays to be fast and skillful, like baby Nona, one of the most experienced of Primal's workers. You do that very, very expertly. Have you been doing this for a very long time? Could you show me how how you do the peeling? Okay. And then you put this through your toe, yeah? Okay. And and go down like that. Oh, it's sort of like skinning something alive. And then down again. Oh, I'm making a terrible mess. I'm driving you mad, aren't I? You can't believe how slow I am. <laughs> if I have no finger left, I'm Party. blaming you. <laughs> I can deal with nine. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I've managed to keep hold of all my fingers, but I've made a right mess of the cinnamon. There's clearly a knack to this that might just take more than a day for me to master. My cinnamon tutor, baby Nona Dayananda, belongs to a caste of people, the Salagama, who've been the enduring guardians of cinnamon throughout all the chapters of Sri Lanka's colonial past. Exploiting their skills was crucial to Portugal's plan to monopolize the spice trade here. You are from a special caste of people that are totally connected with cinnamon. Can you tell me a little bit about the salagama? Well, 
ඊට පස්සේ නීතියක් දාලා තියෙන මේ ගහක් වත් තලා ගම මිනිස්සු ඇය තමයි පුරුදු කරගෙන තියෙන. තලීමට. ඒ අය අර වෙන කවුරුවත් ගහක්වත් කැපුවොත් මරණීය දන් දෙන්න ඉන්නේ නැහැ. It was the Salagama's skills with cinnamon that saved them, even if it meant they lived as virtual slaves. Those skills include the final part of the process, the building of the cinnamon quills. Okay, baby Nuna is going to show me how to make a quill, aren't you? She's looking a little doubtful. I don't think she has much faith in me after the peeling episode, but let's try. Okay. So oh, these yeah. are the bits I peel. Okay. So this becomes like the outer casing oh, and everything gets packed beautifully into it. Mm -hmm. So then you carry on. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you really push pack it in, yeah? Oh. You did make it look really easy and it really isn't. Mm. So there's a lot more to a cinnamon stick than meets the eye. And that will sit drying, but every night you'll roll it a bit, won't you? So that then tightens it up. And that will happen for two weeks, and you will finally get your beautiful regulation length cinnamon stick. That's a lot of work. You're amazing. You know you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> cinnamon requires a lot more effort and skill to prepare than pepper. It is literally a handmade product. But the knowledge possessed by people like Baby Nona is gradually dying out. So you really push, pack it in, yeah? And what about today? I mean, you are still working in cinnamon. You said that your father taught you how to be a cinnamon peeler. Are you worried that um, other young Salagama, like your daughter and your son, will not go into the cinnamon industry? <laughs> so if I practice a little bit more Shall I come and work with you? <laughs> the Portuguese weren't just after Sri Lankan spices, they'd also come to claim souls for Christ. They were determined that if the cinnamon trade was to be theirs, they would have to convert as well as conquer. But in some parts of the country, they met determined resistance. I'm heading inland and up to the hills of Kandy for a unique festival that celebrates an important victory over the Portuguese. This is amazing. I can't imagine that there could be any more people. It's like the whole of Candy have piled out onto the streets. Okay, ready? Yes! Yeah. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs> have a lovely day. It's so exciting. Look at everybody's faces. This festival, known as Perahara, not only celebrates the Buddhist faith, but also the defiance shown by the local people to the foreign cinnamon hunters. When the Portuguese realized that this little island was home to their precious cinnamon, of course they wanted to take over the whole place. And where they met the most resistance was here, the kingdom of Candy. 
Those 16th century rebels harassed and attacked the Portuguese everywhere they tried to establish cinnamon plantations. Now, Kandy is home to the holiest of holy sites, if you're a Buddhist, the Temple of the Tooth, wherein lies one of Buddha's teeth. So the Portuguese thought, if we steal that tooth, we'll break the spirit of the people of Kandy and take them over no problem at all. So that is exactly what they did, except that the tooth they stole was a fake. And the people of Kandy were never subjugated by the Portuguese. in the rest of the country, as did the Dutch, who followed a hundred or so years later. And then in 1796, it was the turn of the British. The people of Sri Lanka resisted, as best they could, all these foreign interventions. But they couldn't ignore foreign appetites. Cinnamon was, and still is, an important part of the economic survival of many small farmers. And that includes the cinnamon grower I've come to know, Primal. Today's the day that Primal hopes to sell the cinnamon he's been growing for the last few months. He has no idea where in the world his cinnamon will end up, and his business deals are confined to local middlemen like this one. I've witnessed how much painstaking work goes into making cinnamon, so I'm hoping Primal gets the price he wants. I'm going to land it there, Gigi. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. The negotiations aren't going well. Primal's choices are limited. Does he accept a low price or hold his nerve? There's no sale, and this dealer won't return. These four bundles of Primal's beautiful organic cinnamon represent hours of skilled labor and years of experience. Now, Primal didn't sell them today because he was hoping for a price that equates to roughly £4.80 a kilo in English money, and the man wouldn't give it to him. This is cinnamon bought in an English supermarket. It's not organic and it's not as high grade as Primal's, and it cost £1.47 for 13 grams. Now, there's something not quite right about that, isn't there? That's a 2,000% markup. Someone's doing very well out of this trade, but it certainly isn't Primal or any of the other spice farmers around here. It's not only market forces that play a part in Cinnamon's fortunes, but the forces of nature. 
The devastating tsunami of 2004 killed 4,200 people and wiped out 300 cinnamon farms in this area. And in the face of this destruction, Primal and the other survivors turned to their religion. The day of the full moon is considered holy in the Buddhist tradition, and I've joined Primal and a procession of the local farmers to make an offering of cinnamon to the god Deval. Now this is the deity that people turn to in their hour of need, and it's also the god that the people around here believe saved the temple from destruction during the tsunami. So Primal is hoping that this offering today will ensure him and the other farmers a successful cinnamon crop this year. In Sri Lanka, cinnamon is considered not only good for the body, but sustenance for the soul. A sample from Primal's harvest is a welcome offering at the temple and will be distributed among the poor of his local community. <laughs> I came to Asia to explore the exotic origins of two staples in every British kitchen cupboard. Cinnamon and pepper, two ordinary spices with an extraordinary past. The search for their source opened up the world, and the Europeans who sailed to the ends of the earth for spice made fortunes, while the people who grew them never got their share of the spoils. But the vibrant cultures in India and Sri Lanka, where spice plays a part in everything from sustenance to the sacred, are still going strong. And these lands are still suffused with the scent and taste of pepper and cinnamon. And the Spice Trail continues here on BBC HD at the same time next Thursday.